Thank you, Ellen, and thank you so much for hosting Green Decades Environmental Speaker Series. It's a pleasure for us to be here uh, through all of our, our programs that go from January through June, and thank you all for coming. Tonight's program is on the topic of nuclear power. Recently, the Nuclear Regulatory Agency issued a 20-year license extension to the Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power Plant, even though the state senators there last year voted to close the plant in 2012. The dangers of unsafely stored nuclear waste have been vividly illustrated by the reactor catastrophe in Japan in the aftermath of the earthquake and tsunami that led to the release of radioactive material from spent fuel rods. Tonight's environmental speaker is Hattie Nestel, uh, an activist who has participated many times in civil disobedience in the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant and on peace walks through Vermont. She also participated in an interfaith peace walk towards a nuclear free future from London to Geneva in 2008. It is Hattie's mission to educate the public as to the problems and dangers of nuclear energy facilities, particularly those in in Vermont Yankee and Plymouth, Massachusetts. She has valuable information to share with us this evening and good ideas as to how citizens may become involved and with taking action toward a nuclear-free future. It is people like Hattie who inspire us to become involved and to learn about what's involved with nuclear power plants and to figure out what we, ordinary citizens, can do to make a difference. So I'd like to welcome Hattie to come up. Thank you. Marcia really hit the he head on a lot of nails, and there are a lot of nails with this um, industry. Um, one of the things I like to do when I start is hold up this little prism ball. I don't know if you can all see the light jumping around the room from it, the rainbows that it creates. But all the facets on this little prism are like the multi-facets of nuclear power. And I can tell you that there are a lot. Can everybody hear me OK? OK. If I go too fast, too slow, too loud, too soft, let me know. Um, other than that, if we can hold our questions till the end, that would be helpful. But I wanted to say, when Marcia talked about Fukushima, I don't know about you, but I got goosebumps. It is just terrifying what's going on there. And I will will uh, show some slides of uh, Fukushima and I will talk about what is most current that we do know about Fukushima. And I also will talk about Vermont Yankee, that's the closest nuclear power plant to me, about 22 miles. A third of the people in the United States live within 50 miles of a nuclear power plant. So this really involves a lot of people a lot of people's lives and future. Are, are our children safe? Um, is the radiation being emitted? Do, you know, tomorrow are we going to wake up to sirens and have to evacuate? Um, is the waste going to get transported down our highways? There's a lot of questions. You know, where is our money going? You know, is the government subsidizing nuclear, which they are, at the expense of renewables, which we would be safe for our community. So I, I hope to, to touch on all of these subjects and also jobs and the economy and, 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 and international things. Um, I belong to several different groups. I belong to a group called the Nuclear Free Future Coalition of Western Mass. There's no coalition of Eastern Mass. I invite you to create one and I can help you. Um, our group involves uh, the area around Amherst and Pioneer Valley, Northampton, and I'm from Athol and uh, Greenfield and out that way. Um, and we have many groups that are physicians for social responsibility and other peace groups are part of us. Um, and our mission is to educate ourselves, um, keep current on what's going on in our state, in our country, and in the world with nuclear power. We oppose all nuclear power and all nuclear weaponry.
but we're focusing more on nuclear power because that is the area that we feel has the most deficit of information. More people know about nuclear weapons. They may feel one way or another, but they at least know about them. But nuclear power is as invisible as the radiation that is uh, released from the very beginning to the very end of the uh, cycle. And, um, and then I'm also involved with Citizens Awareness Network, which has been working, uh, Nuclear Free Future is two years old, by the way. And uh, Citizens Awareness Network is 20 years old, and that group was formed to shut down the Rowe Reactor in Rowe, Massachusetts, and they did shut it down. And they continued working on Indian Point, in, on the Hudson, and Vermont Yankee, and Maine Yankee, and Millstone, and, um, Connecticut Yankee, and, and several of those have been shut down. So all we have in New England now is Vermont Yankee, Pilgrim, um, and one millstone reactor that, um, I'm sorry, Seabrook, thank you. And that's on my map, thank you, Libby. Um, and, um, and so I belong to that group, and then I belong to a women's affinity group, and there's some pictures of us in here and on the table being arrested at Vermont Yankee, and we have, as a group, been arrested there 11 times, uh, doing various different actions. Our last one, we actually chained the entrance gate shut. The name of our affinity group is Shut It Down, so we decided we would shut it down and chain the, the, the gate shut. Uh, to send a message. So that's a little bit about my um, background with this. And I've been working on this exclusively since 2002 when Entergy bought Vermont Yankee. Before that, I was working on many things, the weapons and war and different things that probably some of you are working on also. Um, this slide here is from a group called beyondnuclear.org. And I've given, Joan has handed out to everybody a little packet that includes um, websites, uh, bibliography, and a quote from Alice Stewart. And so this is one of the websites on your packet. And I'm encouraging people to use those websites, go to those websites, stay informed, because this is a very fast moving train, very, very fast. So this is Vermont Yankee. I thought I'd start off with a picture of Vermont Yankee so you know what we're talking about. This is uh, right on the Connecticut River. And this is a, um, a blimp here that uh, is actually way above the ground. And it says shut down Vermont Yankee on it. And it's Greenpeace. You can see in the corner the Greenpeace uh, insignia. And they were, um, I don't know how many feet above, you know, up in the air. And taking a picture of them was the editor of the Brattleboro Reformer newspaper and his photographer. So my point with showing this is, this is legal. Nobody was arrested for being up there right next to the reactor. And the white top on the reactor is where the spent fuel is kept. And you've been hearing a lot about spent fuel. The spent fuel pool at Pilgrim, and I'm sure if you're reading the Globe, you're picking this up is four times the legal capacity that it was designed to handle. And the same is true with Vermont Yankee and uh, Indian Point, and all of them, because the government has never created a national repository, even though it promised it would by 1998 in the 1982 Waste, Pol uh, Waste Policy um, uh, Act of 1982. So um, you can see how vulnerable that facility is. Um, I was at a, a panel discussion down in Duxbury and somebody said at Indian Point he was flying around with a friend and they went within, they were, uh, somehow they thought they couldn't go within a thousand <coughs> feet of the reactor. A thousand feet is nothing. Nothing if you intend to do harm. Nothing. There's, there's, there's nothing that would prevent you if you're up there. So uh, that's really the point of that. Um, and then I go to the beginning of the whole cycle, which is in the mining of uranium. And I don't know how many people ever really give that any thought. A few of you. Well, it's a very important and very deadly part. It's the beginning of the industry. 
Once the uranium comes out of the ground, it releases radon and it becomes highly radioactive. And of course, it flies everywhere. It's a speck of dust. And you'll never know uh, where it is. You won't see it, smell it, taste it, feel it. It has not, none of those attributes. You can inhale it. And if you're wearing a, a monitor, uh, a Geiger counter as, a, as a, um, a, a safety device to let you know if you're being exposed to radio, if you inhale or ingest that, it will not show up on your badge. This is a very, very deadly substance. And it won't show and manifest into a tumor or a birth defect child or whatever um, uh, for 10, 20, or even 30 years. Um, I just don't, I want to make sure to mention this book. And they told me, don't leave it on the back table. Somebody thinks it'll be for sale. So I'm not leaving it on the back table. But it's the Helen Caldicott book. How many people know Helen Caldicott? And it's listed on your green piece of paper. If you have those three pieces of paper from Joan, it's listed there. It's the Helen Caldicott book, Nuclear Power is Not the Answer. And this is like Nuclear Power 101. If you, if you only read this, you will really know all you need to know about basic nuclear power and the Nuclear Waste Policy Act and the mining and how it affects the uh, aboriginal people or the native people, the communities, the, the ecosystem, um, and, and all of that. So I, I recommend that. I'm sure, I would imagine the library has it, and if they don't, uh, she actually has a new edition now with Fukushima included. So it's a really, it's a very, very good um, source of energy, uh, source of information. And then I continued with this. I found this very beautiful graphic, and I thought, I just want to show this. To respect the indigenous people, one of the pilgrimages I did last year was from Oak Ridge, Tennessee, to the United Nations. I've done that three times now. That was a three-month walk. And um, we started at Oak Ridge to make the connection between nuclear power and nuclear weapons, because that's the bomb facility of the first bomb at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. I don't know if you know that. And I walked uh, throughout these years of walking. And I started walking in Japan in 1986, I think it was. And um, throughout these years, I've walked with people from Australia. And they're actually going to be walking in Australia this summer. The group is Footprints for Peace. And, um, and they talk about what happens to the indigenous communities because of uranium mining. We know about coal. We know how dangerous that is with the black lung disease and the collapses, et cetera. But we don't know about uranium because we're, there's no uranium mines around us. You know, Newton doesn't have a uranium factory going on down the road somewhere. You know, they are in uh, places far away from here. So we need to know that their message to us is leave the uranium in the ground. And the um, international physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, which is an international physicians organization, has called for a moratorium on uranium mining worldwide. No more uranium mining. So that's something that if you're part of any uh, group, you could sign on as a group, a church group or Green Decades could sign on, whatever. You could sign on to that, maybe even as an individual. But that's a very important uh, thing to, to keep in mind about the uranium mining. And then I wanted to make sure that we touch on uh, the connection between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. And again, how many people feel that they think about that connection? Good. Because it's right there. It's the flip side of the coin. It's Siamese twins, whatever you want to call it. Um, but an average nuclear power plant, and Vermont Yankee's about average, and so is Pilgrim has a thousand times, a thousand times as much long-lived radioactivity in its spent fuel pool as that was released by the Hiroshima bomb. So what, what we're talking about, in fact, one of the, our actions as an affinity group was to hang a banner that read over the energy sign, because that's the corporation that owns it, um, weapon of mass destruction calling it what it is. It's a weapon of mass destruction. The people in, in, in Japan are, we will, I don't know in my lifetime if we'll really know the consequences of this accident. I don't, I don't think so. I really don't think so. They're already having uh, high rates of children dying in 
the state of Washington, because all that's blowing right across. And of course, in Fukushima, we know that that's happening and will continue to happen. And the children um, are drinking the radioactive milk and water and can't play outside. And we, we don't know. It's a very serious thing. So um, a nuclear power plant is not safe and benign because it's dealing with a substance that's, um, uh, you can't predict what's going to happen from one day to the next. Um, this is about um, money. And the only way that nuclear power ever got started and has ever continued is through taxpayer subsidies. Uh, uh, you know, it's about 100 to 1, the government funding of nuclear, for example, versus solar or wind or even efficiency. With the same amount of money that's been put into uh, nuclear, we could have solar on all our rooftops, on all our schools. We could have our buildings insulated. Uh, we could have windmills, uh, you know, dotting the landscape. And we wouldn't be living in a, an evacuation zone. I mean, basically, we're all, if we're living in Massachusetts, all of us are in an evacuation zone one way or the other. For example, you'll see on the map uh, where Vermont Yankee is. It's closer to Boston than it is to Montpelier. It's very, very close. And I don't know how far you are from Seabrook and um, Pilgrim here, but you can go on zip codes and find out. Do you know Libby? No. No. Very close. Hmm? 30 miles. Maybe. From? Maybe 40. From Pilgrim? Yeah. yeah. Very, close. Very close. So Obama, it says here, this was a cartoon from the, you know, some newspaper, that he's offered $8 billion, and that's true in loan guarantees, but actually his total budget, that's for two, South Carolina and, and Georgia, and they haven't even received a permit from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to uh, start to build, but they did and they got the eight billion and they're digging a hole without a permit. For, the, the plant may never be built, that happened a lot in the early 70s, late 60s and early 70s where they bailed out leaving taxpayers with all these loan guarantees. Um, and insurance and everything. But the Obama administration, does anybody know how much is allocated now for new nukes in the Obama administration? Does anybody know how much? I think there's a bill even yet there was. But there's an allocation. It's been, it, it's been, yeah. Um, does anybody know how much the Bush administration was allocating? Okay, the Bush administration, and if you read the Helen Kolbukop book, you'll know about it, uh, was, uh, for $18.5 billion. The Obama budget is $54 billion. So you need to know these things. And one of the ways you're going to know them is if you go to these websites. So I encourage you to do that. And this says, from economic meltdown to nuclear meltdown, nuclear energy investments, even the hair, most harebrained high rollers on Wall Street won't touch this stuff, which is true. Uh, Moody's and Standard & Poor won't go near, uh, the only money going into nuclear will be government. No private money will go. So we thought you guys would be interested and you guys are the U.S. taxpayers. Um, what keeps the industry going? Lobbying. It's as simple as that. It is really as simple as that. As Fukush within the first 24 hours of the Fukushima accident, they were in there lobbying, saying, we don't build them like they build them. Ours are completely safe. And of course it came out, we have 23 reactors of the same design, exactly as Fukushima, the GE Mark I boiling water reactor. Same. And, um, but in uh, the election year of 2008, there was $80.2 million spent on lobbying, the nuclear energy lobby, in one year. In 2009, it was 84 million. In 10 uh, years, one decade, it was $645 million lobbying our congressional um, uh, elected officials. Um, and that's, that's pretty serious. That's pretty serious, and it pays off. The only thing we have to push back against that is what we're doing here and now. We're learning about this issue. We're learning where we can go to find out more. We're learning how to stay informed. So um, we, we can change it. We can change it like Germany did. You know, in Germany, um, 
uh, people have heard the German people now have rejected uh, nuclear power. And, wa and the way they rejected it was, and there's articles in the back table showing it, 160,000 people hit the streets in Germany. And they also elected Green Party candidates into office that were opposing nuclear power. And Angela Merkel, who's a physicist, really got it with Fukushima. She really did. And she did a 180 degree turn. She shut down permanently, permanently, eight reactors. And the rest will be shut down by 2021. Um, so, uh, and she has made announcements and proclamations saying that Germany is going to be the world's leader in um, uh, uh, renewable energy. And this was from Time Magazine, October 28th, 2010. It was a commentary by Joe Klein. I don't know if anybody ever reads Time Magazine, but it was full of all misinformation and saying we can't live without nuclear power. And that was the picture in the middle of the page. And um, it, it's just these subtle ways that we're influenced into thinking, this is fine, this is all safe, you know. Uh, this is our group at Vermont Yankee. And um, uh, the oldest member of our group is the second one here, Frances Crow. Does anybody know Frances Crow from the Quaker groups? Um, she's 92 now, and she's our leader, actually. <laughs> she probably wouldn't like me to say that, but she is. She's just <coughs> fabulous, and she's there with us every Look at her smile. She's having a great time. And uh, she's standing right next to a symbol that we had spray-painted uh, of the radiation symbol uh, at one of our actions. We all spray-painted on the driveway all the way down from the street all the way up. You can see some of the... They blacktop, but it's coming through again. We wrote down things like danger to zone, do not enter, um, strontium-90, tritium, cesium-137, all the dangers that they're creating. And so that was coming through. We were blockading about taxpayer subsidies. That was around um, in April, taxpayer day. And we were sending that message. Um, what goes on with the corporations that own these nuclear power plants? This is J. Wayne Leonard. He owns Entergy Corporation, which owns Pilgrim, Vermont Yankee, Indian Point, and seven other reactors. Um, it's the third largest nuclear power corporation in the United States. His salary, can you read it? $27.32 million a year. That's his salary. His, uh, and this comes from Forbes.com. Everything I'm showing you, I'm going to show you where I'm getting it from. This is Forbes.com. You can go on to CEO salaries and see it. In five years, his total compensation was $89.43 million. And I think you've been hearing about it. I heard it on the news this morning like I've never heard about it before, talking about the conflict of interest between deciding what, uh, on safety or profits. And these corporations are in it for the profits. And I hear over and over and over again, because I follow this very closely, when it comes to replacing something, um, uh, running new cables that are submerged in water at great peril, um, doing any of these things which cost, or they're very costly, they say it's not cost effective. And even to put the spent fuel rods in dry casts, like you're hearing about a lot now, because of Fukushima, they're saying it's not cost effective. It's very expensive to put that waste, but they generated it. It should be their responsibility to make it as safe as possible, which isn't foolproof, but it's certainly safer than having them in the spent fuel pools. So I wanted to um, shine the light on that a little bit. No nukes, no coal, no kidding. This is from nears.org, and that's on your blue sheet also. And they're a very good think tank, and they will keep you current. You can sign up with them for action alerts once a week, or whatever they send them out. And they'll tell you what bills are pending. You know this. What's happening uh, in Congress, what the lobbyists are doing, what's happening in Nebraska. Do people know what's going on in Nebraska? Libby, you're A+. Plus. He raises her hand every time. Um, Nebraska has a number of um, nuclear power plants, and they're flooded from the floods in the Missouri River. And there, if you see, it, there's a picture back there. You can see the water. They're like an island surrounded by water. This is extremely dangerous. You would know about that if you went to the websites. 
This is the historic crossover. Um, and this study was done by John Blackburn and Sam Cunningham. John Blackburn was the uh, chancellor of Duke University and um, an economist. And they did this a year ago, July 2010. <coughs> and you can go on. The source is at NC WARN. And NC stands for North Carolina. Um, and they did this study where um, solar prices are going down, nuclear prices are going up. And there was the historic crossover in July of 2010. So you can't, you no longer can say solar's more expensive than nuclear. That's finished. You can't, you don't hear that anymore. Um, again, this is Frances, and this woman here on the left is Julia Bonifine, and she is a kindergarten teacher in a, a school in Vermont. And she regularly gets arrested with us, and she misses work that day and comes in the next day, and, the, and it always is in the newspapers up there. And the principal says, well, good morning. I know where you were yesterday. And go, they go on with their life. But she wants to be a dairy farmer. And she knows that the cows will have strontium-90 in their milk. She knows that because that's what happens. And so she's with us and um, promoting solar. And um, Francis has figured out that Vermont Yankee would be a great solar site. Um, this is about jobs. We always hear about money and jobs. A million dollars. Um, creates 4.2 jobs for nuclear, 39.7 for reforestation, 13 for solar, and 13 for wind. So there are um, three times more for solar and wind than nuclear, and uh, many times more, about 10 times, almost 10 times, nine times more for reforestation. So this study was done by the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, Heidi Garrett Peltier, Political Economy Research Institute. So you can check that out. Um, then I want to go into health because that's really why I'm hanging in here because of the health situation. Um, and it, this boardroom is saying, first we have to convince the people that good health isn't everything. <laughs> that's, you know, don't worry about it. And, and that's what we were pretty much hearing after Fukushima. Go on with your life. Drink the milk, whatever. Um, I have a copy of this in the back room. And if anybody signs on my email list and they want me to email this to them, I have this on my computer. And I can email it to you. And very quickly, it shows all the different isotopes, the ionizing radiations effect on the body. The strontium-90, the radon, uh, the cesium. Um, there's Down syndrome, breast cancer, intestinal, all of those different things. Re thyroid is uh, iodine-131. We've been hearing a lot about that. Cesium axis, potassium, and strontium-90, like um, calcium. And they go into your body and go to the different places and create the different cancers, including going into the sperm, the mother's milk, and uh, crossing through the placenta. And I put in there the no nukes cow so that uh, Julia can have her dairy farm someday. Um, so this is the map. And I've got one back there if you want to look at it more closely. And I have this on my computer, and I can send it to you. And we've included Plymouth and Seabrook, um, approximately where they are, and Vermont Yankee. And in between Vermont Yankee, which is the middle of the bullseye, is um, about 25 miles from Vermont Yankee and um, maybe 40 or 50 miles from um, Boston um, is the Quabbin Reservoir. And all the water that, that Boston uses is in the Quabbin Reservoir. So if Vermont Yankee blows, Boston can't drink the water. And I don't know how you replace water for how many million people live in Boston. I don't think you can. Plus all the food, there's a lot of dairy areas around Vermont Yankee. A lot of uh, milk, cows, eggs, chickens comes from that area. And this was another one, another shot of the Vermont Yankee with the Connecticut River. And you see that steam? Those are the cooling towers that they are mandated to use in the summer. They're allowed to put the hot water 
not radioactively hot, but thermally hot water back into the Connecticut River at five degrees higher than the river is. But in the summertime, it would be even too hot. So they have to use those uh, cooling towers. And this is what the cooling tower looked like in August of 2007. Did anybody hear about the collapse of the cooling towers in Vermont? Libby. <laughs> anyway, I mean, we're in the same uh, area. We should know. But the news was that there was a slight leak at Vermont Yankee, and the newspapers were not allowed on site. And so the next day in the picture, we hear about a leak, and we see the picture of Vermont Yankee from across the river. And all you can see are trees and clouds. But the next day, this picture appears in the Brattleboro Reformer, and under the caption is submitted photo. This was taken by a whistleblower. And if it wasn't for that, we would never have known about it. This is a pretty serious uh, lack of management, I would say, or upkeep or maintenance. Something's pretty bad about that situation. And actually, right before it happened, there were workers on top of those cooling towers, and they could hear the fan being off kilter. And if it had collapsed with them on it, they would have been killed, a, a number of them. But, you know, that has all come out in the paper. And this is another uh, leak that Bernie Sanders had released from the NRC. Again, when it came out a small leak, that's what a small leak looks like. And that's what a, uh, some smoke looks like. We heard that there was some smoke, but it was nothing. They put it right out. Well, this is the smoke. I think fire is <laughs> pretty <laughs> smoke. obvious. Again, this was taken by a whistleblower, and you can see the uh, Firefighters are there on the ground. That was a transformer fire in uh, 2004. And has anybody heard about the tritium leaks at Vermont Yankee? Joan and Libby. Um, you know who I hang out with. <laughs> um, all the red dots are tritium leaks. And the story with the tritium leaks are that um, uh, the uh, governor uh, the state senate wanted to determine whether or not they should give a certificate of public good that would allow Vermont Yankee to operate for another 20 years for a license extension. And so they appointed an oversight panel and one of the panelists is Arnie Gunderson and his website is fairwinds.com and that's on your blue websites. Fairwinds.com if you want to know about Fukushima primarily. Anyway, he asked the top officials at Vermont Yankee, are there any tritium leaks uh, that could occur from underground piping? Because that's what's been happening. They're, all the plants are old, you know that. This plant was put on line 72. And you know, it's, they're all, no, no more plants have been built for decades now. And they kept saying, there's no pipes that could leak tritium. So um, we did a walk in 2010 in January and um, as we were walking January 7th, the newspapers hit the street, tritium leak at Vermont Yankee. The legal limit, federal legal limit, is 20,000 picocuries per liter. Even though we don't know what that means, 20,000 picocuries per liter, we can think, is uh, allowable. These tritium leaks registered as high as 2.5 million. Picocuries. And we know 2.5 million is quite a bit more than 20,000. And what does that mean to the NRC? Nothing. They never shut them down a day. They never cited them for lying under oath on the record, which they did. And they never fined them. And that's our Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Because of those tritium leaks, the, um, by the way, this person on the left, and I'll go quickly through this, is, um, Martha Hennessy, who is Dorothy Day's granddaughter. Did anybody hear of Dorothy Day? The, yeah, okay, that's Dorothy Day's granddaughter, and that's Pocky Weiland from um, Northampton. And there we are, one uh, talking about the leaks and the lies, and that was the point of that um, banner. But anyway, because of the lies perpetrated by the top officials, 11 of them at Vermont Yankee, on the record saying there were no pipes that could leak tritium, and then the tritium leaks happened. The Senate voted 26 to 4 not to issue a certificate of public good. So at this moment, 
Vermont Yankee has a license renewal approval by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and a no certificate of public good by the state that would enable them to operate within the state. So now Entergy is suing Vermont Yankee, I mean Vermont. The governor, the secretary of, no, the governor, the attorney general, and the Department of Public Service. And again, it's been on the news about Bernie Sanders. Um, has anybody heard about what Bernie Sanders has been doing with the NRC? It's been on uh, NPR and in the papers. Um, on Thursday, there were hearings in Washington, and he had the five NRC commissioners there. And he said, have you gone, because there was a rumor that this had happened, there was a leak from the um, NRC, the five commissioners, have you gone to the U.S. Department of Justice to ask them if they would go on to the lawsuit on behalf of Entergy against the state of Vermont? Have you done that? There's a rumor that you went to the Department of Justice. And guess what, there, did anybody hear what the answer was? None of your business. We don't have to tell you a thing. That was to Senator Bernie Sanders, who is in the state of Vermont. We don't have to answer to you. We are in, I call them the nuclear priesthood because they're above the law. And that's, there's no transparency. The senator couldn't even get the answer to a simple question like that. And what he said and what was in the paper was, you have no business doing that. You're a regulator. You're supposed to be watching them and finding what they're doing wrong and protecting the citizens. Why would you ask the Department of Justice to go and uh, align themselves with energy? energy? So that's what's been going on. And that has made um, really big news. Um, this is uh, Dr. Herman Shear. His book is uh, listed on your book of recommendations. And a large part of his work was in renewable energy for three decades in the German parliament. And that's why Germany is so advanced, a lot attributable to Hermann Scheer. Read his work, it's wonderful. And um, um, we, he died last October. He was on Democracy Now! for an hour, October 15th. You can go back into the archives and watch that. But that is a lot of the reason that Germany is so far advanced. And people who have gone to Germany come back and say, oh my god, there's windmills everywhere. So. Um, that's a name that you should know. Another name you should know is somebody whose quote is on the yellow piece of paper who did groundbreaking work on the effects of low-level le radiation. Her first study was released in 1957. She was born in Great Britain and determined that children that were dying between the ages of two and four of leukemia during that time frame in the 50s were dying twice as likely if they had one fetal x-ray. She did thousands of uh, interviews. One fetal x-ray created a child's uh, doubling their risk of dying of leukemia between the ages of two and four. And she went on to, con she, it's a wonderful book, wonderful book. Did really great work. Okay. Um, and then this is John Goffman, and I have his book here. And he worked with the Manhattan Project, and he jumped the fence as an MD, he, he's a physicist and an MD, when he realized how dangerous the ionizing radiation was to cause cancer and birth defects and all that. This book is from 1979. People can't believe I recommend it, but I do. It's fabulous, and some of the cartoons are from his book. And um, he uh, started the Committee for Nuclear Responsibility at this point. You can buy this book online for one penny. Literally. Um, so I, and he's very, has a great sense of humor besides. But he's one of the most brilliant minds I've ever read. Um, and this comes from his book, and he's talking about the nuclear regulatory agency as being that dachshund there. And I think with, you know, Sanders really, really hits the nail on the head when they say to him, we don't have to answer to you. We don't have to answer to you. And, um, you know, that's about, uh, I mean, there's a lot of com condemnation. Now, we hear it about minerals management agency, food and drug, all the regulatory agencies, the coal mining accidents. We've found out after the fact 
how they were not uh, inspected and how their fines were not paid and they just went on doing what they did because of profits. It was all driven by po profits. Congressional action. Mm-hmm. Congressional. Laxity. Mm-hmm. And then if we're going to talk about the waste, this one says, nuclear waste problem, I don't know about you, but I don't want my kids growing up in a world where there aren't any problems left to solve. And the truth of the matter is, who's going to deal with the waste? And I hope you'll get a chance here in Newton to see the movie Into Eternity, which talks about the waste project that is being built in Finland. It's going to take them 200 years to build this waste repository. And uh, this whole movie is about how do you warn people in 1,000 years, 5,000 years, 10,000 years, 100,000 years, 500,000 years, not to go near this site where all this high-level waste is stored and still dangerous. I mean, it's a terrifying thought. What language do you use? What materials do you use for signage? It's not possible. Into Eternity, very good movie. Um, this is Chernobyl. Of course, we have to mention Chernobyl. This is the dead zone around Chernobyl with Vermont Yankee in the middle. Um, you can see that would definitely include um, the uh, reservoir of water for uh, Boston, but that's permanently uninhabitable. We don't know, we, have, we imagine that Fukushima, because there were four reactors there, at number seven uh, category like, like uh, Chernobyl, we imagine there will be a larger area of uninhabitable lands, but the radiation has also impacted the ocean and the sea mammals are registering large amounts of radioactivity in their bodies and we don't, we don't know what, what the result of all this is going to be. We really don't. And that has to be taken as a warning. Anything exciting happened at the nuclear plant today? That's somebody who's just come from Fukushima maybe. Um, and I think that this is very important. This is a picture of Fukushima, March 15th, 2011. Lessons learned. There is no safe nuclear power. That's the lesson I hope people will learn. And I want to just quote from the Boston Globe. This is the Sunday Globe, March 27th. And in the Sunday Globe, and the Sunday Globe is not all one way or the other. I'm not putting down the Sunday Globe as the Sunday Globe, but this, uh, this editorial it, I think was very serious. It says, for now, it appears that the worst case, in scenar in, uh, worst case scenario in Japan has been averted. I don't know what they were basing that on. I really can't imagine how they spit those words out, where that came from. And we, some of us, I think, at least, have a pretty good idea that there's a major disaster going on in Japan. Major, 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 major. And Germany, Switzerland, Italy, and now France and Japan, and even China's having second thoughts about it, are all going no nukes. But we're not, and we have to get to that place. But then it says, um, but that shouldn't stop the rethinking, which should result in more stringent stand standards and rigorous enforcement to ensure that plants in the United States are the world's safest. And that is techno-scientific hubris. If you want to write that down, you can quote me. It's from um, uh, Charles Perrow wrote that when he wrote the book Normal Accidents. Techno-scientific hubris. To say that we or anybody can have a safe nuclear power plant. That's all it is because it's just not safe. It can't be safe. And if it was safe, even while it's pumping away, there's no safe disposal of the waste, there's no safe mining of uranium, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Trains, ships, boats are all flying and pushing this stuff around. Can't be safe. So I thought that that was unfortunate. I gotta keep moving here. Exploded, 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 meltdown, 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 right? One, two, and three now are uh, admittedly melting, melted down. And the fourth one, we don't know what's happening with it. Arnie Gunderson, who's been in the business of nuclear engineering for 39 years, says, I don't know what to make of four. 
If you watch his videos, it's, it's very informative. Um, but it has 20 years worth of spent fuel rods stored outside a containment. That means it's open to the uh, universe. Very serious thing. So what to do? People want to know, well, what can we do? Subsidize energy efficiency and renewables. No subsidies for nuclear power or fossil fuels. Does anybody know about the statewide uh, commission created by the Deval Patrick administration called Green Communities? Green communities. Newton's a green community. Okay, Newton's a green community. This is a very, very good um, program we have in the state of Massachusetts where there's $10 million allocated for towns that. That's what, that's what I'll show you the, uh, the, I'll show you their website. Good news is we can do it. Um, there's the solar. This is the Green Communities web, off the Green Communities website, and it says $10 million per year. I don't know. That's what it says. I, I think that uh, more communities applied, and so they divided a smaller portion to the community. So Newton ended up getting a grant, I suppose, but it wasn't as much as, uh -huh. still a very good thing. It mu it was, it but it must have been 100 or 200,000 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So anyway, there is the money available, and great that Newton's doing it because you can uh, um, insulate your buildings, your old buildings, you can change your lighting, um, and you can create a solar field, a wind farm, whatever. So it's a really good project that we have in this state. And now, I don't know about you, but almost every day when I listen to National Public Radio, there is new wind and new solar going somewhere, and it is very exciting, and it is happening. We can definitely do it. We can go and create a carbon-free, nuclear-free future. And this is uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, and I agree with this, are calling for a nationwide moratorium on new nuclear reactors in the United States, a suspension of operations at the nuclear reactors of a similar design as those in Fukushima. So that would include Pilgrim, Vermont, 23 of the reactors. And then uh, this is Ira Helfand who goes around the world and around the country speaking on behalf of the physicians saying uh, that clean renewable energy is the safest, most sustainable and viable solution and nuclear power risks are particularly significant for public health. So there you've got the doctors taking that position. And that is the end of my slideshow. And I've done it within the 40, about. <laughs> Because I wanted to give you plenty of time to ask questions and have conversation. Because you know I can go on for a very long time. Uh, I, yeah, I think you need to be a bit careful about that radiation uh, and fetal death because it was not a controlled study in terms of we're going to take one group and give radiation. The ones that were radi the ones that had the X-ray might very well have had reasons that they did have the X-ray that were independent of the X-ray, and it's. It's, it's somewhat dangerous to do an Xbox hoax that this group had an x-ray, this group didn't, and these group died more than it was due to the x-ray. They were x-rayed for some purpose, and we, unless it was a controlled study, one of the things we've learned is that it's very dangerous to make sort of after-the-fact interpretations like that. I, I understand what you're saying about a controlled study. I totally understand that. In fact, I'm having a big fight now with the Board of Health in Vermont because they're saying that the strontium-90 that's in the bones of the fish, the American uh, shad in the Connecticut River, is from Chernobyl. And I'm saying if they're in the Connecticut River where Vermont Yankee is and they, fly, they, go, they swim right by it and go back and forth in the migration, and there's no control group, how can you say that um, the strontium-90 is from Chernobyl? So I understand exactly what you're saying, but and I'm not a doctor, and I'm not a scientist, and I'm not a physicist. And I'm reading the studies, and I'm reading the awards that that woman got, and the recognition that she got for that work. So I'm just reporting her, what her report said. And it was, it was highly acclaimed. That's all I know. Um, I didn't go to elementary school in Newton, but I have a distinct memory of being in seventh grade and two men coming into my classroom to talk about how great nuclear energy was. 
and how we were going to shoot it out into space once we were done with it and everything was going to be perfect. And I remember thinking, this is not right. And to this day, I mean, I still think back about it. Like, was that a dream? And none of my friends remember it. But does the industry employ people to go around spreading propaganda to school children? Uh, I can't answer. I, 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 I don't know of anything like that. You know, that's the first I've heard of anything like that. But they have a budget for PR. For example, the state of Vermont, which only has 600,000 people, they spent on PR last year um, $780,000. There's only 600,000 people in the state of Say Vermont. Entergy. Entergy. Spent, they have a full page ad on, in every newspaper. They have radio. They have television. They have people paid to write letters to the editor. They, create these videos, and they donate money to anything that they can find to donate, whether it's a little league field, the old age home needs new windows, um, the choir needs new music, the museum needs a new exhibit. So they throw money around like water. They give it to the land. Anybody that asks them, the daycare center, they give more money than they're asked for. And I've been to meetings where people stand up from the United Way, the museum, the daycare center, the old age home, et cetera, and talk about how much money they were given, more than they even asked for. Uranium mined in the U.S., and where is it mined in the U.S., and where, what other countries? Yeah, it's the, the largest uranium mining country in the world is Canada, and the second largest is Australia, and that's why the Australians are so active. <coughs> Uh, they don't have any nuclear power. They have all the mines. Um, and in the west, uh, southwest, it was on Navajo land and uh, Diné land and Shoshone land, a lot of the Native American lands. And now those particular nations have uh, uh, created a moratorium on uranium mining on their lands. Um, after many years of horrible diseases by their miners. In fact, they, would, they throw the, what they call slurries, all the waste, you know, after they process, they get, they leach it, you know, they have to wash it and leach it and do all these things to extract the uranium. And they leave these slurries of water and the rocks that now they're finished with laying around. And, you know, after 20 years, nobody knows why those rocks are laying around. And they built schools with them, and they built homes with them. And then the people got sick, and they discovered what they had done, you know. And that, but it's also in Kajikistan. It's in certain countries in Africa. Um, supposedly, they found a uranium mining in West Virginia, a, a uranium deposit in West Virginia. I haven't heard that the mining has started but I heard that, that they found some uranium in West Virginia. So, um, you know, they could find some somewhere uh, else, but it's been mostly uh, in the native lands out in the south, southwest. Could you envision us here in the States following Germany's footsteps and organizing a protest? And if so, would it be helpful if we signed up for something like that here? Well, you know, the, you know, my line is if Germany can do it, we can do it. And uh, Italy just had this wonderful vote. 97% of the people that voted voted against nuclear power. And the Greens are uh, really carrying that in uh, France. And there's going to be a huge walk for one month in France on nuclear power. Um, somehow it... <laughs>